and I'd like to introduce the three speakers who will speak to us, and they're all sitting here, who will speak to us about um, alcohol and drugs. It's the name of the session. However, it's more about substance use and um, the effects on community and how we, how we understand it and how we deal with it and its impacts on oral health. So I'd like to introduce, uh, firstly, Anne-Marie Laslett, who's sitting here, who is a senior research fellow at the National Drug Research Institute, has recently finished her PhD, was a, um, a very, is still a very dear friend of mine and a um, colleague from dental days. She's a dentist also. So um, she is, she's done a lot of work in um, alcohol's harm to others, um, and the harm to others from drinking, etc. And she will fill you in on um, what she's going to speak about. After her, we'll hear from Daryl Annette, who is a principal solicitor at Salvation Army's Urban Justice Centre. Um, and all these speakers' bios are on the website, so I'm not going to waste time by filling you in um, about them, and they will speak for themselves. Uh, Penny Francis is our team leader in alcohol and drug um, in the alcohol and drug team here at North Richmond Community Health. And Penny has been very involved with our oral health program also. So without any further ado, I'm going to pass the microphone on to Anne-Marie. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. It's actually lovely to be back amongst so many dental and community health people. I think I've missed being in this, this sector. I know how hard working everybody is and how many, you know, ways they make a difference in people's lives in their, in their everyday practice. Uh, I was. I mean, I really enjoyed the session today too. I mean, in the mindfulness session, I was thinking, you know, it's interesting that, you know, one of the six tenets of Buddhism is that one should refrain from intoxication and to enhance mindfulness. So I sort of thought, oh, that kind of relates to my sub, my topic. And as, you know, when I, we had the family violence um, session, it was interesting because, you know, when I think about the some of the work that we've done, we know that between 35 and 50% of family violence incidents also involve, reported to police involve alcohol. And, and a lot of, I mean, you know, 13% of alcohol intoxications that present to emergency departments actually in, involve um, injuries to the head and face. So alcohol and other drugs are involved in a whole range of, um, of public health problems. So I'll... So there are a range of different drugs that we see used in Australian society. We've got caffeine, marijuana, synthetic cannabis, methamphetamines or crystalline meth crystal meth or ice, tobacco, ecstasy, inhalants, alcohol, heroin, oxycontin. There's many drugs. I guess Australian's drug of choice is usually alcohol and tobacco would be our second most favourite. And really, I guess when we talk about drugs, we're talking about um, substances which, take in, when taken into the body, affect the chemical processes of the body. And psychoactive drugs are those that affect cognition and mood and behaviour. We use many of these or some of these drugs in, therapeutically in dentistry. So we um, use them for pain control and anxiety management. So this is something that we see in our everyday practice. When we look at how many of us use which drugs um, over the lifetime, you can see these are from the National Drug Strategy Household Surveys. And we can see that actually we've been reducing our use of alcohol and tobacco. Um, we've got fairly stable rates of cam cannabis and the amphetamines um, with some evidence of increasing use of ecstasy and um, cocaine. Although when you look at the most recent drug survey, which is 2013, we're still getting reductions in alcohol and tobacco. We, the only drug we're seeing an increase in is actually um, the... Uh, the illicit pharmaceuticals, so we're seeing an increase in those. They've increased from about 4% to 7%, but that's not on this slide. So we also can see that this, this, the yellow, the dash between the, in the yellow boxes between the two figures shows how much the difference there is between lifetime use and recent use. So when you look at uh, recent use of alcohol, I mean, uh, nearly 50% of the population are using alcohol weekly, um, whereas, you know, 2.5% of the population have used um, uh, ecstasy in the last year. So we're looking at really large differences in prevalence rates for different of, for use of different drugs and subsequently harm associated with these drugs. We've known about a lot of alcohol-related harm and other drug harms that have been present um, for centuries. This is a print from Hogarth and you can see in this slide that we've got um, there's suicide in the top right house, there's um, 
child abuse, street violence, um, financial ruin, death, loss of amenity, breakdown of public order in communities. So our legal drugs are associated with a, with a lot of um, harm um, throughout history and contemporarily as well. Some um, oral health problems are also common amongst those people who misuse a range of drugs. So this, is, this can be attributed both to the xerostomic nature of the drugs themselves as well as poor oral hygiene, which is associated with you know, lifestyles and disadvantage. Um, we see, for example, with alcohol and tobacco, a much higher burden of disease, of oral disease, with, oral, with alcohol and tobacco being involved in oral cancers and precancerous conditions. They're also involved in salivary gland diseases as well as um, substantial numbers of injuries to the head and neck. Um, in, we can also... The amphetamines, though, in particular, have been linked to teeth grinding, TMJ problems, dry mouth, altered sensation and repeated damages to dentures, crown and bridge work. I guess, and we, there has been a lot of talk in the media recently about an ice epidemic. And when you look at the straight numbers, you can see that there have been um, increases between 2010 and 2012 um, in the numbers of people that report, um, that are attended to by ambulances across Victoria. This is metropolitan Melbourne. But you can see that only 0.7 per 10,000 people are treated, for example, um, for um, methamphetamine-related problems in ambulances, whereas, you know, almost 50 times that rate are treated for alcohol-related problems. So I guess m some of the reason why there probably is a lot of um, media concern about crystal methamphetamines is that the presenting symptoms can be quite disturbing and the purity of ice has increased recently. So while there's not evidence that more people are using ice, um, there is evidence that among existing users, problems are increasing. I mean, there are a lot of reasons why people can become aggressive and ice is one factor amongst many. Um, I mean, recently, I th in, in I think just this well, last week, the College of Emergency Medicine also showed that in the vast majority of drug-related cases that they manage, alcohol is a factor that's Im implicated both in the problems that present to them as well as, as you know, seriously affecting the, the working lives of their staff in emergencies departments. So they, you know, talked about their staff being assaulted and scratched and verbally abused on a, um, on a regular basis. So what do we do, I guess? In Australia, we've used a public health approach to better understand alcohol and other drugs. Now, this, this approach emerged in the 1960s that, and it describes that really drug use is learned and functional. It's not really necessarily good or bad. We use alcohol, um, yet we might stigmatise um, a range of other illicit drugs. Um, we need to, in this model, examine three, three main factors. So we look at the drug, we look at the user, and we look at the environment. So, for example, when we consider what, what the drug is that, we're, that people might be using, we think about how much did they use, how pure was it, what was its alcohol content, um, what was its route of administration, was it used with other drugs. All of these things come into play and make use of a particular drug more or less dangerous. We also have to consider individual factors, so we look at the general health of the person. Are they able to metabolise the drugs that they're taking? We look gender matters, um, older people are less able to met metabolise particular drugs and then there are sort of uh, behavioural and psychological um, differences that occur at the individual level. So what are your expectations about what you might get from that using that drug? What's your mood? Um, and then also, who are you using with? Are you using alone? Are you using with friends? Um, these things all come into play. So this is an example of... Um, we can see what drugs are there. We've got alcohol. It's probably the rate of consumption looks pretty rapid. Um, we've got tobacco as well. We know the alcohol content because it's not an, it's not an illicit drug. There are regulations around how it's... Um, how it's manufactured and how, how it's served and who it's served to. Um, yeah, we can also see that this person is drinking with a friend, so they're not drinking alone or they're not using in a back street alley, um, using an illicit drug um, and in that way being at more risk of overdose. Well, then again, though, I guess if you, if you use around other people and you use problematically, you can be, end up in situations where you may be disinhibited, you might do things that you might not normally have done and that can result in 
you know, street violence or domestic violence. Some of the work that we've done has actually looked at the harms to others around the drinker rather than just to drinkers. And so when you start to stack up the statistics from um, different sectors and apply um, economic costing models to them, we can see that there are large, very large numbers of, of, of people that are affected by other people's drinking. And in some ways, this is even more of an issue for alcohol, for example, than for, say, t tobacco. I mean, pass passive smoking was a strong argument for pushing changes in the tobacco area. But, I mean, I think it's something like, well, 50% of harms to, from alcohol are to others, whereas, you know, I think it's sort of 2% uh, of harms are for passive smoking as opposed to, um, you know, 50% for alcohol. So we're, we're seeing differences there. I need to be mindful and breathe, don't I? <laughs> Speaking too fast. Um, so harm minimisation is... Um, one of the key strategies, the key public health strategies that um, Australian governments and um, academia and non-government organisations have pushed forward as a way to handle um, alcohol and other drug use and problems. And I guess um, it, it assumes that, you know, drug use will continue to be part of society. We're not going to ban alcohol. Um, we think that eradication of a whole range of drugs is probably impossible and perhaps continuing to, you know, to eradicate um, you know, to, for example, to imprison everybody who uses um, uh, illicit drugs well, ends up with more and more people in, you know, in our prisons and therefore they're, they're not, they're harm, their issues aren't necessarily managed and we have huge costs to society that might be worse than, you know, perhaps considering, um, uh, you know, legalising or um, uh, legalising some of these drugs or making them available in, in a very controlled manner. We, um, thank you, <laughs> um, and, and I guess we, we use three main strategies in public health, which is, you know, reducing the demand, reducing the supply, and reducing the harm. So, when we look at um, demand reduction, we can increase the price of different drugs, so we can do that with alcohol and tobacco, and that's what governments tend to do. You can introduce a minimum price, and that will see, you know, less alcohol consumed often by the people that can least afford it, but that's, they're often the group that are also least um, or most affected by the a range of different diseases that are, are connected to that, to alcohol and tobacco. Um, we can have, there can be health promotion, but there, you can also limit, it, limit advertising. And there's a whole range of ways in which advertising is not very well regulated across the Australian community. And you can also think about um, encouraging people into the treatment system so that therefore they, um, the, the demand for a whole range of different drugs is reduced. With supply reduction, um, policing is a big, big part of a supply reduction, but it can, as I've sort of alluded to, it can have um, um, unintended consequences. Um, you can also, you could perhaps reduce the drinking, you could increase the drinking age, you could, um, you can introduce lockouts, you can limit opening hours, you can, um, yeah, introduce secondary supply laws, which, um, for example, um, encourage people not to provide alcohol to the to children, other um, other than their own in their own house, or and then they can make the decision about their own children. Um, so there are a range of different ways in which supply reduction might be introduced, and then harm reduction. So that again assumes that there that people might continue to use drugs, and how, what can we do? If they do, we can um, try to help them to use the drug as safely as possible. So that includes in the illicit area, um, needle and syringe programs, methadone programs, um, controlled drinking strategies rather than abstinence-based strategies, and um, education about a whole range of aspects. We also have a range of oral health problems that we can manage. And I guess many, many um, dental professionals will do this as part of their everyday practice. But if someone's continuing to use drugs, and they're xerostomic, and they do have implications on their for their for their oral health. They still need to provide good quality, um, basic preventive care. Provide, make sure that they've got access to care, so they can have their tr their pain managed. And we would hope that there's referral between different services, so that the general problems of the individual dental clients that you see are also managed well. Just a, sort of a, a second last slide. 
working with alcohol and drug clients, I think it's really important to remember to try to understand their lifestyle and the drug effects. You might be better to treat people um, when they're well maintained on methadone than when they're in withdrawal. You might be better, you need to be aware that you know, there are other complications that are, that are in their lives and so you need time to be, um, to manage their anxiety, to be flexible about making appointments. You need to be competent, you need to know about the different drug interactions that can occur when you're using two depressants plus a painkiller or a whole range of different things. And you need to make sure that what you do prescribe doesn't contribute to overdose if you're, if you're doubling um, um, a concentration of um, depressants, for example, antidepressants. Um, or depressant drugs, sorry. And I think, yeah, there is um, a need to make sure that people who are using drugs that don't feel stigmatised, they, they are encouraged to come to the dentist to report fully about the different concerns that they have with their their own um, with their own oral health as well as their their lives and this is a service that is available if you want to know in more, want more information about um, about withdrawal or about um, adequate pain management while people are on other drugs so this is um, the Victorian number there are similar numbers for other states I'm going to rush through and then if you need help for your own or your fam or someone in a member of your family's um, drug and alcohol problems there are a range of these numbers that you can, they can use. And I think these slides will be available um, after the conference. So thank you very much. I'm sorry I rushed that.